welcome NutritionRadio.org listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry, the university nutrition professor of over 20 years and podcast host of long-running shows like Iron Radio. Come on in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Nutrition Radio. This is Dr. Lowry. You know I've been a professor for decades now, and I consult for the food industry and, uh, and academia. And we have Abby Stack with us again. Hi, Abby. Hello. How are you? Doing well. Uh, my name is Abby Stack, and I major in biology and exercise science. All right. Our resident student nerd. Which, yes. That's what we need. That's what we need. All right. What are our topics today, everyone? We're in our last month of uh, Nutrition Radio here. The food trend is that younger people don't consume as much alcohol. Uh, and that's very interesting to me because it's funny being older. One of the things that I do when I go to campuses, I'm like, where's the bar scene? Like, where are the bars at? You know, and that might be less of a thing now. I don't know. I'm not saying college students don't party and that kind of stuff, but I'm always curious, like, where are the pubs and the restaurants and, and, you know, where do people go? Cause growing up at Kent state, uh, and I was really there for a very long time, that was sort of the center of what people did, you know? And so it'd be interesting to see uh, what's going on with that. In um, the nutrition science, we're going to talk about exogenous ketones. So Abby's doing some research with that. We can talk about what they are and what they do. In the weight management section, we're going to talk about bringing sort of recipe rehab or high-protein dishes to some of the holiday events that you might attend. Everybody knows the average person, at least in the States here, put on a couple of pounds during the holidays. So we'll talk about how to sort of avoid that. And then we're going to do a taste test of the corn, Q-U-O-R-N, meatless nuggets, chicken nuggets, chicken as in (laughs) C-H-I-Q-I-N, not real chicken. (laughs) Uh, We'll we'll do a nutritional rundown, and you you can see maybe if you're interested in some of these alternative uh, chicken nuggets. But let's go back to our first one, then, the food trend. So you mentioned Gen Z. Uh, and health awareness and alcohol. So uh, what's going on there? Market news, food and fitness trends. So it seems that Gen Z drinks 20% less than millennials. And some polls also show that adults under the age of 35 who drink has fallen from around like 72% to 62%. Mm -hmm. So... Of course, everyone's wondering why. And I think a lot of it can be attributed just to healthier lifestyles and people, I guess, waking up to the effects of alcohol. I know that um, recent research has looked at um, the effects of low to moderate alcohol consumption because, I mean, it's it's pretty well understood that high alcohol intake typically ranging from usually they say like 12 to 24 drinks per week has long been associated with like neurodegeneration affecting the neocortex responsible for storing the associated memories and facilitating thinking and planning. But there was never really a clear relationship whether, you know, one or two drinks a night would would do this. But um, recent research, recent studies have shown that even just one to two drinks per day shows signs of thinning of the neocortical um, cortex. Yeah. So I think I'm not sure if Gen Z is 100 percent like reading these studies and and that's where they're not like you (laughs) choosing not to drink. Not like me, maybe. But I think that maybe just word of mouth and just more what surrounds the culture around drinking is a lot less enticing just because people do recognize how bad it is for you and people maybe value their health a little bit more. Yeah, that's interesting. I know the government guidelines changed. I mean, for decades, Mm -hmm. it was, you know, men can have two drinks a day. Women can have one drink per day, alcoholic drink. And you might actually get some improvements in heart health or blood lipids or whatever. And they have since dropped that, right? A couple of years ago, uh, here in the U.S. at least, the official recommendations from the, you know, nutrition authorities and the government, it was, hey, none. None is best. And that was a change, right? Because... I've even like, for example, I have a family member (laughs) to say, and he would always be like, uh, oh, yeah, I like to have my glass of wine or two, you know, every evening. And it's just going to help my heart health. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't have dyslipidemia. Like you don't have high cholesterol or 
you know, you don't need to boost anything or, you know, you have high blood pressure. This is not going to do you any favors, man. So I think that's what they wanted to get away from, right, was this idea that, oh, alcohol can be healthy. And, yeah, I mean, there is some impact on your blood lipids, and it could raise HDL, good cholesterol, and this and that. And But, yeah, the guidelines kind of echo with what you're saying. So even if people your age, Abby, aren't drinking as much or they're not reading a bunch of studies, they're somehow getting the message that maybe – Maybe this is a risk. But let me ask you then, I mean, being on a university campus, what do you see as far as this? Is there still a pretty heavy drinking culture and partying culture? Or it probably depends on who you run with, of course. But like what vibe do you get from from university life as far as how people are, are drinking alcohol? You know, I, I don't know what university life would have been like, I guess, in the past and what drinking culture was like. But I'm pretty sure it's still very similar. People still, you know, if they're going to some sort of football game, and this is this is pretty evenly spread across. Like, I've visited different universities. If there's a big football game, people are usually going to drink. If it's Saturday night, people are usually going to drink. And yeah. I, I, I don't see it being very different than when it was in the past. I mean, I've met a few select individuals who like still go do those things and they don't drink, which I mean, maybe there there's more of them than there w- there would have been in the past. But mm-hmm. I still think drinking is a really big part of a college student and college campus culture, I guess. But right. I, I would be interested to see what the divide is in the Gen Z who are choosing not to drink and of those who are college students and of those who are not. Right. You know, good point. I mean, 20 percent, that's a big number. That's a huge drop when Mm -hmm. you talk about population scale things. Yeah. So that made me wonder about that kind of stuff. Now, we did talk about in a recent episode of Nutrition Radio a couple of weeks ago, we talked about fake drinks, fake alcoholic drinks. Mm -hmm. And I just saw some on the shelf in the local grocer. There was like fake gin. There was fake rum or whatever. Uh, do you think millennials, and again, I know this is just opinion and it's not like uh, numbers like you're giving me earlier, but yeah, what about the, the faux cocktails and stuff? Um, do you think you know people who would do that or would they say there's no point in that because I'm not <laughs> getting a buzz? You know, like what do you think the younger outlook is for that? Or is it hard to say? It, it is hard to say because I know people who again, go to like these functions, like a football game or out on a Saturday night and their intent of drinking is to right. be intoxicated, right. not really right. like to enjoy it. But I also, I have friends who are my age that don't enjoy doing that. And they're more of a go out to dinner and maybe order Cocktail. like a Moscow mule type of thing and sit mm-hmm. down and eat it and drink that. So I, mm-hmm. I would see that maybe if, those were more available at the restaurant, for example, to order or to purchase that definitely could interest a specific crowd. But I don't know. I don't know if it would be um, college students in their like right. college function. Yeah. Attractive type of thing. Yeah. When we were talking about it on air, the one use I would think, because, you know, some people drink for a social lubricant. And mm-hmm. so I can see someone saying like, if I don't want to overdo this, maybe every other drink would be one of these mocktails, you know, one of mm-hmm. these faux uh, alcoholic drinks or something like that. But that's probably age related. I don't have any numbers on that. But I would think as people get post university age, um, they might want to go try some fancy cocktail or something or do take the occasional faux alcoholic drink. Um, mm-hmm. Earlier this year in the news, we covered how. It seems as though people who hit it hard when they're drinking, it does more damage than uh, lower dose, moderate frequency drinking. So it almost Mm -hmm. suggested that maybe a lower dose, like a one drink in the evening a couple times a week is way less than saving it all for the weekend and then doing all six drinks all at once, you know, but Mm -hmm. what you're, what you're saying is, and this is what's disturbing to me is the cortex of your brain is actually thinning uh, in response to even a low dose, right? Yes. Yep. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Nobody needs a damaged neocortex from a, a little bit of uh, drinking. I like that because it gives you a reason not to. I was never a big proponent of just say no, you know, because mm-hmm. yeah, when your friends are all going out and having a good time, sometimes it's really hard. People are, you know, dead sober and they're with their friends and you feel like you're babysitting or something. <laughs> yeah. 
you yeah. know, other, otherwise. Yeah. To your point about, um, like the people who maybe drink at nighttime, like daily, one thing that one trend I've seen, um, in people who are Gen Z is having like nighttime mocktails and they will actually put, they'll mix together like one of those like poppy sodas, which are like, uh, microbiome healthy is what they kind of uh, market it as. They'll mix that with some tart cherry juice and magnesium for sleep. So that, I feel like that would honestly net benefit you more than, um, an alcoholic drink probably yeah even than even than wine yeah that kind of stuff yeah. that's usually considered healthier like wine yeah that's interesting stuff uh it does make you wonder like how the food industry is going to try to ad- address that like if there's less drinking mm-hmm. how are they going to do that light beverages mocktails you know how are they going to continue to sell or are they just going to target older people who they think drink more <laughs> you know from a marketing True. kind of thing you know what? Side note: I can smell those corn chicken nuggets <laughs> coming really? out of my kitchen. <laughs> yeah, they smell like chicken nuggets. Uh, okay. Yeah, they do. All right, let's let's get to the nutrition science, and because this is something that you are on the bleeding edge of, because you're actually a scientist collecting data when it comes to these exogenous ketones. So let's start by defining what we mean by an exogenous ketone, like how supplemental ketones. You know, are they different from just getting into ketosis with a super low carb diet? Maybe we can start there. Breaking nutrition science. Yeah, so there's there's usually three types of exogenous ketones. You have your exogenous um, MCTs, which you probably all know of. You know, medium chain triglycerides that you know, enter through the hepatic portal vein, um, converted to acetyl CoA, stimulate ketogenesis in the liver, and that's how they will increase actual endogenous ketone levels. So your own ketones will be raised from um, their supplementation. But exogenous ketone salts and ketone esters are more, um, I guess, unnatural, if you want, if you want to say that, because mm-hmm. they're composed of synthetic BHB, beta hydroxy butyrate molecules, and they're for the salts, they're usually chemically bound to an electrolyte or an amino acid, which provides like molecular stabilization, and they'll elevate the ketone bodies directly, and they do not require liver metabolism, therefore, so it's not like your own endogenous ketones. And then exogenous ketone esters, um, they can be mono or diesters, are usually They'll end up in your kind of GI tract and gastric esterase enzymes will just cleave off the beta hydroxybutyrate or the acetoacetate bound to an ester backbone. And this will be catabolized into the BHB or the alcohol or the aldehyde dehydrogenases. And then they also do not require liver metabolism. And they're often in studies, ketone esters are far better at raising your t- ketone levels to a greater degree than um, ketone salts. And so with these three supplementation avenues, you can induce a brief nutritional ketosis, which is similar to that as if you were to be on the keto diet, but it will only last as long as um, those ketones are kind of present in your blood. And once you've kind of, I think from what I understand, metabolize them, you go back to burning the available glucose or carbohydrates. Right. Okay. So gold nugget I'm trying to get for listeners here. So you would recommend the ketone esters. You can get those as a supplement, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, You could buy them in drink form and I believe they have powder form as well. Mm -hmm. I would definitely recommend those, but they, they are very um, steep in price as of right now, pretty expensive compared to the other two options. But I think that's because they are so new and there's, um, not many companies making them quite yet. Right. But they're more powerful than the salts, so you could, in theory, take less. What's the dose then? Are you familiar with the, like, what people would have so to take I, to get into ketosis, uh, nutritional, supplemental ketosis? <laughs> I'm familiar with the exogenous ketone esters. The other two, not as much. Um, yeah. For the esters, a lot of products will give you around, like, 10 grams For example, like the drinks that we use in our research, they're like 10 gram drinks. And there's one study 
where they do a 28 day duration of daily exogenous ketone ester supplementation and they do 75 grams a day. So that's probably the oh, highest I would go because mm-hmm. that, that is a lot, but I would, I would say like 30 grams maybe will keep it elevated for a pretty good amount of time. Should people be concerned at all about like uh, overdoing it? I mean, if you take too much, are side effects going to ensue? I mean, how do you get yourself into supplemental or nutritional ketosis here? And the reason I keep saying it that way, of course, is because uh, mm-hmm. most of our listeners, a lot of them know metabolic ketosis from being on super low carb diets, at like 50 grams a day or less. Some people get into ketosis mm-hmm. way faster than others, but that's something that your body evolved to kind of understand is natural, right? Like there's not carbohydrates coming in. So your body is going to use ketones as a, as a fuel, alternative fuel, if you will. But Mm -hmm. what you're talking about with supplementation has just, to me, it's so foreign. Like the human body could be in a carbohydrate replete state, like plenty of carbs on board, glycogen, blood sugar, whatever, and in ketosis. How weird, right? Because the body, I think, has been, oh, the fuel switch goes from blood glucose, like you were saying, to, you know, you become uh, fat adapted, if you will, or if you get into ketosis, it's like a switch and you start using those more. Uh, but when your blood sugar is also high and you're in ketosis because you're literally swallowing BHB, I mean, that's got to be a very weird metabolic state, right? That it's it's no wonder we need people like you starting to research this because that just sounds like something that doesn't happen in nature, if you will. Is that fair? Yeah, def- definitely fair. I think that there's still a lot unknown and they're even just like – there's still a lot of even just like dose response research that needs to be done to understand how much you need to take for how long you want to be in ketosis for. I think there's like a clear divide. There's like people who want to research it as a method alternative to ketosis. And then there's people who want to research it as a method to enhance ketosis, which I think oh. it can do both things. But if yeah. someone, I guess, is already on the keto diet, they describe exogenous ketones. I've seen them like anecdotally described as something that really enhances their mental clarity. Like it, it, it raises their um, ketone levels like through the roof. And a lot of different benefits have been described by uh, people who already are on the keto diet. But I'm not sure exactly if it would be more worth it for someone who is already on the keto diet to supplement with it or if it's worth it for everybody just in different ways. Okay. Yeah, and I guess that's sort of the the crux of what I think you're doing is uh, is sort of cutting edge is you're looking at one of the benefits, right? Like what are the good things? Like you said, maybe a fuel for the brain, enhance uh, clarity. Uh, what would be good about having high levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate? And that's the one you're going to measure, right? Is that the – just for listeners. So that's sort of the central – of the three ketone bodies, that's the one that's the big focus? Yeah, definitely, definitely the big focus. And we're using ketone ester supplementation um, supplements. So we wanted to look at um, C-reactive protein levels over like a chronic supplementation period or just we were just going to do one week daily supplementation. We were going to do 30 grams per day and see if it had any impact on reducing C-reactive protein, because there's not really there's a lot of evidence to suggest that. Um, Ketone supplementation supplementation can reduce inflammation, but obviously that's like a super broad statement. But I think that C-reactive protein is a pretty standard blood test that a lot of people go seeking if they do want to kind of know their baseline inflammation levels. Mm -hmm. So I thought it would be pretty, pretty applicable. Um, A lot of other research surrounding it has looked at like animal models, obviously, and cellular models where they kind of treat these cells with the exogenous ketones and blot for different cytokines. Like I think IL-6 has been blotted for, which obviously leads to the release of CRP. So theoretically it should work, but obviously, you know, when you play, when it goes into the body, obviously the play out is is a lot different than one cell, but um, they've blotted for like TNF alpha and found, uh, uh, decreases in that release from exogenous ketones. But as far as uh, decreasing inflammation in human beings, research wise has not really been clearly um, elucidated, I guess. Mm-hmm. So for listeners, you were pointing out that 
So there's different ways to look at inflammation. One would be cytokines, right? Immune proteins mm-hmm. like interleukin-6, interleukin-1 beta. There's a couple of TNF, right? Tumor necrosis factor, mm-hmm. factor alpha. You mentioned those. Those cytokines can then tickle the liver, if you will, to make C-reactive protein. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, specifically, IL-6, I believe, does it. But I think TNF-alpha somehow acts on another mm-hmm. cell, which then causes IL-6, which then causes right. CRP as well. <laughs> No, perfect. (laughs) Because, yeah, so the point being, this is complex. And is it worthwhile for listeners to get their CRP levels checked? Is that a test that's sensitive and effective and they know that that's, is that a risk factor for certain diseases? Why are you measuring CRP? Um, yeah, it, it it's a huge risk factor for a lot of different diseases. And it, and it's a little bit concerning because typically when people are ordered a C-reactive protein test, from their doctor, like if they ever would be ordered one of those tests, it's usually to find out maybe if someone has had like a heart attack or if someone maybe is, has an autoimmune disorder, because those are obviously inflammatory events or inflammatory conditions. And that's when your CRP is going to be sort of through the roof, but even just minor elevation. So when we're looking at CRP, I usually am talking about HSCRP, so high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Um, okay. testing, which can kind of differentiate between like one milligram per deciliter and two milligrams per deciliter, like very small amounts. So I think it's like somewhere around two thirds of Americans fall below two, but like the other third falls in between like two and three and two and three is still considered like a minor elevation and um, having a CRP test with minor elevation of CRP has been associated with of like a multiplicity of various cardiovascular conditions, mm-hmm. as well as development of uh, diabetes, I believe, hypertension, a whole laundry list of things that you do not want. Right. And, you know, a lot of listeners, I think it, it would be worth it to understand a lot of our chronic diseases are in low grade inflammatory states, right? Yes. Obesity, diabetes, like you said, heart disease. Uh, there's uh, quite a number, and we live in this kind of pro-inflammatory environment with lots of omega-6 fats, and we kind of touched on this in, in the past, you and I have, on the podcast here, Abby, but would you recommend that if somebody is probably pretty healthy, that they, they ask for a high-sensitivity CRP test because the other ones, it's going to be too coarse to even be of benefit to them? Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend the HSCRP test. A lot of the population literature surrounding, like trying to, I guess, um, make those links between people having these chronic inflammatory diseases or developing these chronic inflammatory diseases and testing CRP usually tests HSCRP. So I would definitely um, recommend that one as opposed to the other one. I think the other ones maybe just a little bit more for a doctor who is sort of trying to diagnose a condition where right. super high inflammation is present. So they mm-hmm. they can see like a, mm-hmm. they can see that big difference. But I mean, if you're just like a normal person and you're, like a fitness you're person not, or yeah. 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 I think like nature released an article. It was a while ago, but like I think the, the title is just like chronic inflammation is the etiology of disease across the lifespan, which yep. was just like sp- spoke novels to me because that's just i mean so Absolutely. yeah de- decreasing inflammation in our society is is definitely um at the forefront of my concern at least yeah well i mean think about me as i get older i mean i hear the term in science circles a lot in manuscripts and, and industry friends inflammaging right that inflammation oh, gets yeah. <laughs> worse as you age and i mean not just something you can feel in your joints i think listeners understand but what abby and i are talking about it's not like swollen joints it's low grade inflammation you don't feel Mm -hmm. it could be along the linings of your blood vessels or i mean any number of things um yeah and inflammation aging inflammaging is one of the reasons i take curcumin and fish oils and i try to do all this stuff you know you you hear some people Mm -hmm. talk about uh, daily aspirin and anything that's going to try to reduce either higher levels of cytokines or uh, some of these proteins like C-reactive protein that Abby's talking about or prostaglandin E2, you know, you take aspirin to block mm-hmm. that, that inflammatory marker. Yeah. And even physical activity, I think, is going to be short term. It can be pro-inflammatory when you get real sore, of course, but long term, mm-hmm. it has some anti-inflammatory effects. Do you think that 
if you look at a healthy athletic college population, they're going to have low CRP then, and then it'll go even lower with the ketones. Well, we're we're actually looking at middle aged um, persons oh, like from the community good. Mm-hmm. because we, I don't think that college students would have that that raised CRP. There you go. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, def, definitely not. And I I think that to move a needle with college students, even if if there was any um, effect of the supplement, it probably would be negated by like the especially at our on our campus, everyone's like an athlete, so right probably wouldn't be worth a ton to go seeking crp changes right. in, in those no good people. answer if, if they're already yeah. bottom out because they're so healthy and not inflamed how are you going to make that go any lower right they're already yeah like, <laughs> sick. yeah that's good that you're doing that it might be fun in some of your pilot work to just test on each other and see if some of you guys mm-hmm. that are lean and very fit you know how low is your crp just for yeah. like i said just as part of the pilot work or whatever so hard question before we move on What's the end game here? What would you like to be able to tell the world from this research? I personally would like to, well, I would like to see first ketone esters come down in costs a little bit, but I would like to tell the world that supplementation with ketones may be a valid avenue to, you know, just decrease low grade inflammation. Mm -hmm. Because I think, a lot of people who do the keto diet often like kind of rave about the mental clarity aspect of it. And just, I think that just stems from being chronically inflamed. You don't really know how it feels to not be chronically inflamed because you are. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's just like everyone's constant state. So I guess from my research, I just want to be able to say, you know, maybe try this Avenue. It's not as much as a commitment as going through the entire keto diet and making sure one gram of carb is not set you apart that you can you could do this, but you could do it in a way that's a little bit easier, I guess, um, mm-hmm. because I think a lot of the keto diet research, although it's it's super awesome, it's really hard it, to get people to to adhere to that diet. So I just want yeah. to kind of explore some of the alternative options and be able to kind of report any evidence like can people who aren't not not willing, but aren't able to adapt their lifestyle at that time to a keto diet? Are they able to um, kind of reap some of the benefits as those who do? Right. So you're going to ask people to keep a diet log just to make sure they're eating a normal diet just to confirm, right? They're not in ketosis. They're eating their normal diet and you're just going to add on the, um, the ketone esters, right? Yep. Yep. We just request that they keep their diet pretty similar throughout the um, supplementation period. That's only like kind of stipulate stipulation i guess is that like they're not eating anything super crazy but they're also not obviously going like low fat just like normal meals each day yeah you know one thing that final thought because of some of the my colleagues in the food industry they will point out that for regulatory reasons you cannot market dietary supplements as Mm anti-inflammatory at least some of the bigger more reputable companies they're not going to want to say that much because, you know, the drug mm-hmm. companies, hey, inflammation is our purview. You guys, you know, even though it's obvious that some foods like fish oils, sounds like maybe mm-hmm. ketone esters, they could have anti-inflammatory effects, but that's going to be a tough thing for the supplement industry, I think, because if you show that it's anti-inflammatory and from a regulatory perspective, they're going to be like, well, you can't really say it that way. I wonder how they're going to have to make their claims. They're going to have to get clever, I think, how they make yeah, how they make their claims, you know, but no good stuff. And it looks like, yeah, that's a, it's an expanding field. And most people know how popular, I mean, gosh, think of all the keto people with the, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> butter in their coffee or coconut in their coffee and all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> all right, next up, we have the weight management tip. So you mentioned considering a filling high protein dish. Uh, to different holiday functions to help manage your hunger and that kind of stuff and not fall off the wagon, basically. Weight management tips. Yes. So when I attend holiday parties or gatherings, and and this isn't just 
the the gathering itself like the main like thanksgiving or if you celebrate christmas christmas it's like everything all the parties that surround that as well because you know you have the second christmas and the second thanksgiving and the first right. thing yep so i've noticed sort of the main culprit for a lot of the excessive calorie intake isn't necessarily the actual meal it's not you know your turkey your mashed potatoes your macaroni and cheese even you know you you get your plate you fill it up and you eat it and you, you get pretty full but um, I would say that the more often the challenge arises during kind of like the pre-meal period when we're waiting for the meal course and, you know, hunger sets in and you start to kind of snack on the various appetizers. And I, I mean, it's not hard to just keep eating, you know, some crackers or some pretzel bites just to keep eating. And you'll still be hungry most for the most part after that. And then you'll still indulge on your um, your main course meal. So I would suggest personally bringing an appetizer that, you know, is filling maybe high protein, um, nutritious, something that you can snack on and that you can kind of cover your nutritional bases. Ensure you're getting, I guess, macronutrients prior to the big meal. And so, you know, that you kind of like a little bit of peace of mind. And that way you're also not starving. <laughs> yeah, I have long said, and everybody, uh, Abby and I were talking about this before we hit the record button. The problem with the weight gain over the holidays, and people do gain a couple of pounds over the holidays, and oftentimes those are the pounds that don't come off. You know, people talk about as they go into their 30s and 40s, they wake up one day and they're, I don't know, dozens of pounds heavier. And it's like mm -hmm. maybe that's the holidays or when that's happening because physical activity tends to be down. Everybody's in sort of storage mode. And there's this 30 day thing. Like you said, it's not just the meal. Like mm -hmm. I've had some fellow dietitian friends who are like, oh, recipe rehab for each one of these things. Yeah, you could do that on some level, but I've always been a fan of actually indulging in the meal and not really worry about the saturated fat content to my Thanksgiving mm -hmm. meal you know, yeah. or, or a Christmas meal or whatever. But yeah, then the leftovers or like you said, it's the snacking. I know we were talking about this, but my family would do stuff like um, pumpernickel bread with like spinach dip. And there's lots of opportunities I can think there. You could take that along with you, use Greek yogurt or make it a higher protein kind mm -hmm. of thing or lower fat if you wanted to, if you want to go that route. And yeah, and do some of the the damage control, if you will, on the other stuff, like you said, because you, you can end up snacking yes. all day long while your family's just sitting around drinking eggnog and eating cookies. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and if you don't want to do that, yeah, it might be good to have an option. And I like what I like about this is it's culturally acceptable within your family. Like nobody's gonna be like, oh, Abby, that's so weird. Or, you know, because <laughs> I like I never did that when I was young and I was competing in bodybuilding. Lonnie, that's so weird. You won't eat anything but the dry turkey. Like it just becomes a little bit weird because is it really going to yeah. make a difference in your physique? No, not one day. If anything, mm -hmm. you'll probably replenish your glycogen stores and be better, <laughs> be better for oh, it. Oh, yeah. You know, but yeah, it's that constant snacking and leftovers and that kind of stuff. Or if you just want to have something around your house for snacking, like you were saying, not just the meal, but what can you do to up the protein, maybe sneak in some fiber, some vegetables, something, cut back on the sugar and unnecessary amounts of fat? Because yeah, I'm a big believer that it's, we, we make, we make the holiday season here in the States, a 30 day extravaganza of leftover <laughs> office parties, house, you know, family, um, school, mm -hmm. all this stuff just ends up on your countertop as leftovers, cookies and cakes. And now do you have specific, uh, any other thoughts about recipes then? Um, yeah, so I, I, I had two that I thought were kind of applicable here. I think that your best option, your best bet is to maybe make some dip you know, because you could dip either some cookies in there or some crackers, but you can also dip like veggies and fruits, depending on savory or sweet. And I think they're very normalized. So no no one would question your sanity, I guess, if you brought this to a party. Um, mm -hmm. So the two the two I kind of had was a healthy buffalo chicken dip. So a mix of, you know, just cottage cheese, ricotta, ranch seasoning, buffalo sauce, shredded chicken, and just kind of bake it at 425. And it gets it gets that um kind of golden brown top and put some chips on the side, some veggies as well. And I mean, there you go. That's high protein. And you could definitely like fill up on that a little bit while you're waiting. And then a second one, I thought if you have more of a, like a sweet tooth would be it was kind of like some non-fat Greek yogurt, maybe some vanilla protein powder. And then it had like a little bit of sugar cookie mix 
with um, some cashew butter in there, some okay. vanilla extract, kind, kind of like a like a sugar cookie dip is what they called it. And then you could put on the side maybe some strawberries, apples, and then you could also put like Oreos and graham crackers, just like kind of like a sweet dip. And those two things together, I think, will kind of or together or apart, whatever you choose, if you wanted to bring one of those could kind of give you an option, something to snack on before or even after, because I know like sometimes Sometimes for me, the period between dinner and dessert is a little bit too long. So it could definitely, could definitely give you some options there too. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that idea. I've actually not given as much thought to that because there, there's very hardcore fitness people who might be like, well, screw what your family thinks. You're on, you know, a schedule and you're disciplined. <laughs> That's fine. But when you think about like the mathematics of fat loss, and we've covered that on the show and that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. this is not going to make or break you. It's about your mindset. Mm-hmm. And if you can make it holiday ish, you know, yeah, that does make sense to me. It's, it's a little bit less relaxed, not just less weird as far as, Oh, I care about what other people think, but just, you can enjoy the holiday and get in the holiday mood a little bit by it, adding some healthy ingredients. I think people can tell by what you just said. What, what do we mean by healthy? Stuff like, like you said, some nut butters, or these are not just low calorie, super hard diet. You know, when I was competing uh, in bodybuilding for the longest time, my wife and I, we had two terms. One was on diet. And that meant like dry turkey and green beans, <laughs> you know? And then there was healthy, which was a little more normalized, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. it was the turkey and the green beans, but you know, yeah, I could do something like have a, a healthy snack, like you're saying nut butters or some kind of vegetables in a in a spinach dip, or and you know it, it's sort of a mid range. You're getting phytochemicals, yeah. and fiber, and some veggies and all that kind of stuff, uh, but you're not like in hardcore lose mm-hmm. fat mode necessarily. You know. Okay, uh, that leaves our taste test, rant, product review, or recipes. All right, so final segment here. We're going to taste test corn uh, meatless chicken dippers or what mine are called. Uh, Mine's pineapple chipotle. What are yours called, Abby? Mine were just, I think, regular. They look like like they might have like some garlic seasoning in them. (laughs) Okay. I just pulled mine out of the little toaster oven. You said you air fried yours. It's important for people to know. You cannot just nuke these. I thought, oh, I was just going to go nuke them. They're probably weird little processed nuggets. No, you have to actually bring them up to 165 internal temperature and all that. So 15 minutes in a toaster oven is what I did. And you did air fryer. So mm-hmm. they look like chicken nuggets to me. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I'm not a big chicken nugget eater in general. So I no, don't really I know much either. to compare it to. <laughs> but, tear, uh, tear it apart. What does from, it look like inside? Yeah. Or? When I look at it inside, it's got kind of like that uh, fibrous texture. Like, like I, I definitely can remember like eating Wendy's chicken nuggets. Like, um, mm-hmm. so I think it has like that that similar texture. It's not just like breaking apart like white nothing. <laughs> I guess you know if you know mm-hmm. it, like doesn't look just like a blob. <laughs> so we're doing this partly everybody because mycoprotein M Y C O fungal protein. It's a complete protein source. This company won some awards. There's actually a QR code on the box that I looked at, and it'll take you to the website. There is a mycoprotein allergy advice on mine. It says mycoprotein is a oh. mold, a m- member of the fungi family. There have been rare cases of allergic reactions to products that contain mycoprotein. I'm not discounting that. You have to be careful. But there's also allergies to other protein foods, dairy and eggs and nuts mm-hmm. and and all that kind of stuff. Now, could you um, can you find on your box somewhere like is there a claim or is there anything that they're they're kind of advertising here for this uh, fungal protein? Not really, other than the the thing that it says about just saying myco. Um, mm-hmm. The only thing I could find is on on the back if you're like looking deep in the ingredients, but there's nothing big big word wise that says like oh this is fungal protein, you know? Right. I do have on the front of my box part of what's on the Nutrition Facts panel. So they're pushing 12 grams of protein per serving, uh, mm-hmm. soy-free, 9 grams of fiber. How does yours break down? Can you read through the Nutrition Facts panel, like the macros? Mine says it has uh, 6 grams of fat, 41 grams of carb, and 13 grams of protein. Okay. Yeah, mine says 10 fat, 38 carbs, and 12 protein. 
Mine is nine fiber. What does yours have? Could you say? Um, four grams of fiber. Okay, so a little bit different. Yeah, mine yeah. are again pineapple chipotle. You know what? Let's give them a taste. Let's see what you, what you think. Mm -hmm. I know, like you, I'm not much of a chicken nugget mm -hmm. eater. <laughs> that's what I remember chicken nuggets to taste like. I guess. What do you think? Yeah. Not bad. I mean, that's a um, fungal protein. No. Yeah, that's. I think mine says like yeah, forty seven percent mycoprotein ingredient first first ingredient. I'm kind of for mine. I'm taking the breading off in my second bite to try to just taste the inside. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, there's nothing weird. Like if you think is a mold weird or I mean, let's face no. it, mush, mushroom burgers are not a new thing. So people do use mushroom based oh. like fake meats. Yes, I see the allergy statement on mine now. I missed it before. <laughs> yeah, I think it's not bad. Again, mine has that pineapple chipotle flavor. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not real intense, honestly. But yours is plain would have probably been better. Yeah, I tore my box. It's kind of hard to read. It, it says something about yeah. unique protein blend, mycoprotein, a unique blend of protein and fiber. Producing okay. mycoprotein uses less land and water than animal protein production, so it's better for the planet, too. And it says vegan. I got a little vegan leaf on here. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't. I can't find that on mine. They do say we think it's great. If you don't, if you're not totally happy, return the package. Uh, like I said, they have won some yeah. awards, and I've looked into this before uh, for this kind of thing. I like this the most because, unlike a lot of plant proteins, this is a, a higher quality in my mind, right, compared to a lot of what you might get. So it's um, a complete protein. It's not missing indispensable amino acids. There is a lot of carbs, actually. I know nine of it for me is fiber and not as much for you as fiber. But if I look at the ingredients yeah. list, it says mycoprotein, 44%, and then enri enriched wheat flour, rice flour. Mm. So basically, I got flour as the second and third ingredient. Yeah. Wheat protein mm. isolate. I find that a little odd. Mine just says wheat flour. So mycoprotein is ingredient one. Wheat flour, then water, then wheat starch. Canola okay. oil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, canola. Weirdly, they bolded wheat gluten. Gluten is one of those things that some people avoid and some people are like, oh, it's a plant protein. So uh, is it good because it's plant protein or is it bad because people avoid gluten? It's just very confusing for a lot of people, I think. So is this, would this be useful to you? Now, I know you're a pretty strict fitness person, how you eat. Um, or is it not something that I you mean, would not, probably... not a ton, because me personally, um, I, I find it hard a lot of the times with the vegan alternatives to make them comparable to, like, actual meat. Because they, like, although I think in their attempt to uh, make it meat tasting, they have to sacrifice a lot, a lot of the nutritional benefits of meat. And then at mm -hmm. that point, it's like. Maybe you should just eat meat. <laughs> right. Agree. Agree. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I was going to say, would you recommend this to someone? And if so, who? Yeah, I, I don't think it would hurt to, uh, like, recommend it to maybe my some of my vegan friends because it, they are pretty tasty. And maybe – but I wouldn't recommend it to anyone who's vegan and is, on a, and is also super into fitness because I think they would kind of look at the macros and be like, yeah, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> No, absolutely. Yeah, so. I mean, that's why I saved this for the Nutrition Radio podcast, right? Because there's people who might want a yeah. snack. Is this a worthy snack? Not for a fitness enthusiast. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but it is a, a, a quality source of protein. You know, mm -hmm. Mine even has 550 milligrams of sodium. That's pretty high. It's pretty freaking high. Mine um, is 590. Oh, even higher. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's not crazy, but it, that's not exactly a low-sodium food. But, you know, they're chicken nuggets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. that's that. I'll have to go take a quick look online and see how much sodium and protein and things are in other other chicken nuggets. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing regular chicken nuggets don't have nine fiber like this. You know, you said yours had four? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, fiber and protein, that sounds good. But then when you're, you start mm -hmm. looking at the fat content and... Overall, it's I still look at this as a guilty snack in a way, unless you yeah. again, unless you're trying to, as a vegan, reduce animal suffering. I've seen, you know, terrible documentaries about how they treat chickens and all that kind of stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I still realize, listen, the, the 
cycle of life thing is real that you know agriculture feeds like 90 plus percent of the population and you have to industrialize that on some level so yeah but if if you're trying to uh, reduce that kind of animal suffering and look for something i think this might be better than like soy i'd probably choose this instead of soy which was the fallback yeah. protein for ages yeah, uh, I would be interested to see something like this, this myco protein and maybe like a healthier <laughs> version that you could purchase it and maybe cook something up with it. That is not a chicken nugget. <laughs> yeah, why not a patty? That's just because, mm-hmm. yeah, I peeled off the bread like you did, the breading. I think they mm-hmm. can make a patty out of that. And then that would really yeah. cut down on all the flours and oils and stuff that they have to use. Definitely. Yeah, maybe they gear this toward a more of a fitness crowd for with a patty that's not so breaded. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, there it is, everybody. There's your four segments for the day, ending with the corn thing. Um, overall, yeah, I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to buy these again probably myself, but not because they're <laughs> nasty. They taste like chicken nuggets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, mm-hmm. we'll see everybody next week. The NutritionRadio.org podcast is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, check with your physician, nutritionist, or qualified exercise physiologist in order to make the progress that you need.